<laughs> so if I could prolong that any longer. But alas, I have to come do my job. So anyway, we're going to continue our uh, series uh, we've been doing now, this is our fifth lesson uh, about resolving conflict. And doing this for the very simple reason that conflict is one of the universal issues in human relationship. We all deal uh, with relational conflict. This is unpleasant, I know. Uh, it is frustrating often. Uh, but the truth is we all have conflict. Uh, in life, and most people are very unskilled uh, in resolving conflict. We're good at having it, right? I mean, we are, uh, we are gifted in creating and prolonging and enlarging conflict. But resolving it seems to be uh, very difficult for most people. But thankfully, the Bible gives us wisdom about conflict. And uh, some of the things we've discussed that we will reiterate in each of our lessons. Number one, conflict is a heart issue. At, at the most fundamental level, conflict is about our heart. But if we're going to resolve conflict, then it's an issue of understanding. To resolve conflict successfully involves understanding which has the implication then that there is a skill involved. You can learn how to resolve conflict. You can get good at it. And I would advise you, if you want to live long and prosper, you need to get good at it. Because conflict is not going away. But getting good at resolving it uh, is a crucial uh, part of the success in a Christian life. And so, uh, we've talked about a number of issues. This morning, we're going to talk about responsibility in conflict. Responsibility in conflict. Let's go ahead and get our first scripture, uh, Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. Judge not that you may not be judged. For with the same judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? But do not consider the plank in your own eye. For how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look at a plank, and look a uh, plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, then you will uh, see clearly uh, to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Okay, so we're talking about responsibility in conflict. Let's talk first about faulty vision. Faulty vision. Now, this is going to be a bit of a, a repeat. We've discussed this already, uh, but it needs to be emphasized. Uh, in conflict, our focus is often uh, incorrect. Uh, first, we focus on the fault of the other person. Of course, that's why we're in conflict, right? It's what they did to us, and so that's our first uh, primary focus. We focus on the details of their offense. Right, we know uh, in great, uh, in high definition clarity what they did, what they failed to do, what they said, how they said it, uh, their tone of voice when they said it, right? Hello, their facial expression. You ever have your mom say, Don't look at me in that tone of voice? <laughs> when we were kids, we thought your mom was crazy, but you get in conflict with someone and you're like, Did you see how they looked at me? Yeah, I know what they were thinking. And so our focus, of course, is on them. And then, as we discussed last week, we begin to focus on their motive. We have uh, this idea that we know why they did it. We're focused on their motives. We've become mind readers of sort. And so, yeah, no, the real issue is I know that they meant to hurt me. Or actually, it's because they are evil. That's why they said it. Uh, I know, Pastor Heinberg, you always say you've never met any evil people. Yeah, you need to meet the person I'm in conflict with. They're the first. It's, it's the devil incarnate. I know. Uh, they're not Christians, whatever. So w the point is we focus on what we perceive their motive uh, to be. Then uh, we focus on ourselves incorrectly. You know, we talked, uh, we did an entire lesson on focus in conflict, but we begin to focus on ourselves. We focus on our feelings. I am hurt 
I feel disrespected. I am disappointed. I am angry. Uh, we focus on our rights, right? This is interesting, right? It's, it's just, but pastor, it's just not right. They shouldn't do that. It's not right, right? As if we've got this invisible bill of rights somewhere we're holding up. When I walk into church, I deserve, and they violated my rights, I should be treated differently. And then, of course, uh, we usually tend to remove our responsibility from the conflict. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm the innocent one. Uh, I am the victim. And because I feel bad, right, my feelings and my rights make me assume that I'm correct. So... Our scripture highlights this very uh, painful reality, and that is that we may not be seeing things correctly. Matthew 7, verse 3. Okay, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? So, here are the things. I'm going to just suggest some things. Listen, uh, don't blame me. Just blame the notes uh, here on the page, right? I don't want you to be angry at me, but I'm just going to suggest some things. Maybe you're wrong, right? In your conflict, maybe you're wrong, of course. Uh, you might be uh, completely wrong. It might be that you completely misunderstand the entire situation um, uh, and uh, you're the cause of the conflict. Friday night, right before the men's rally, I was sitting in prayer, and a uh, pastor came up, and he kneeled down next to me, and he said, Pastor, I, I, I have to let you know something. And I said, what's that? And he said, I cursed you. And I was like, and I'm like, what? first of all, why are you telling me this right before I preach? You know? And I was like, okay, now why is that? And he says, because I think you're a good man. And I was like, what? I said, back up. What did you just say? He said, Pastor, I trust you. Oh, you trust me. Okay, because that means something totally different than what I heard. You know, maybe you're wrong. No, Pastor, they really said it. I I'm sure you believe that, but maybe you're wrong. Maybe it didn't happen the way you imagined. You could have the facts wrong completely, or maybe you're interpreting the nature of the events wrong. You know, they said something, and, and you didn't understand where they were coming from, or there was a misunderstanding, right? As our scripture says, if you've got a plank in your eye, it's possible you could be misinterpreting things. You might just be seeing things wrong. There was a man... Uh, in the Hobbs Church. He's still there, a great, uh, faithful saint. And uh, he had terrible vision, and so he had really thick glasses. But his vision was so bad that he could never tell that his glasses were dirty. I mean, it was just bad. And so, you know, I, I wear glasses. I'm sensitive to that kind of thing. Like in the morning, I'll get steaming hot water. I, I, I want them clean. And so he'd talk to me, like, Jesse, I can't even look at you, bro. Go clean your glasses, man. You know what? You would never ask a guy like that to clean the windows. <laughs> so maybe if there's, if there's an issue in your life, it's hard for you to see uh, the, the actual issue. Then, of course, they may not be as bad as you see or as you perceive them to be. Matthew 7, we're going to look at a number of different verses through this, this whole chapter, but the whole chapter kind of revolves around relationship issues. And Jesus, you know, Jesus is pretty smart. And when he's talking about relationship issues, he forces this comparison. He says, if you've got a plank in your eye, how can you see to remove the speck in the other person's eye? Listen, he's making a point. Maybe they're not as bad as you think. It's really just a speck, right? When maybe your issue is bigger than you've imagined. I love that Jesus forces the comparison. You know, so you could be wrong. They may not be as bad as you think they are. And then, of course, you might be responsible for the conflict. You know, you could be partially responsible. That's the most likely scenario in every conflict. You may have caused the problem in the first place. 
You may have contributed to the conditions that caused the problem, right? You, you created the environment or you, you created the setup for this. Maybe your reaction made the conflict worse than it needed to be. Uh, you know what? People can do some knuckleheaded things. Is that true? Maybe there's a couple of you that agree with me. You're, you're afraid this is a, a trick question. It's not. Right, but the problem is a lot of times it's our reaction. We blow up. We've got words of anger, cutting words. Oh, right. Like You're sorry now? Right, so now we can actually make things worse. Even they start, but now we are enlarging the issue, insulting words. We bring up the past and unrelated issues. You know, uh, someone has one minor failing today and you want to talk about the last 10 years, every failing they've ever had. Proverbs 12, 18. The tongue of the wise brings healing. Reckless words pierce like a sword. James 3, 5. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. You know, what's interesting about that uh, text is I've read commentators about it. We naturally think a big forest, right? You know, a little spark can create a big fire, which is true. But there's another way to interpret that. A great forest could be talking about something that's, that's wonderful or beautiful or powerful. Uh, just a little thing, little words can destroy beautiful things. James 3, verse 8. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a re restless evil full of deadly poison. Okay, so here's the point is that it's possible uh, that we, in our reaction, may have made things worse. We could have enlarged or exacerbated the problem. So, on the other hand, we must consider that uh, we might be totally responsible for the conflict. I understand in most conflicts it's, it's the contribution of two parties, but sometimes it's all us. And we have to be willing to admit that if we're going to survive life, if we're going to have healthy relationships that stand the test of time, there's got to be a point to which we realize sometimes I am uh, the, the knucklehead. It's all me. It wasn't you. And so we have to be willing to accept that at some point. And uh, one of the things you realize as an adult is this horrifying reality that sometimes you're mad at people for things that you did. And that, that's, that's one of the great moments of maturity when you realize, you know what, I'm mad at you and it is all my fault. You did absolutely nothing wrong. Okay, let's uh, stop there for a moment. We'll open up for some questions or comments before we move on. Talking about faulty vision. If you get a question, you can lift your hand so I can see it. Anything at all before we move on. All the questions are happening in the entryway at the moment, apparently. <laughs> All right, let's talk then about the results of faulty vision. The results of faulty vision. First, faulty vision will affect our ability to resolve conflict. That was kind of the point of the illustration. Jesus says, if there's a plank in your own eye... How can you see to remove uh, the speck in your brother's eye? In other words, how can you possibly fix anything if there is a plank in your eye? C can we be real about that? Right? Anything, right? Uh, you couldn't fix a cup of coffee with a plank in your eye, right? This is the point. If you can't see things correctly, nothing will ever work in life. It's never going to work as it should. You're, you're not going to have peace in relationship. Uh, you're not going to have a healthy conflict resolution. Uh, nothing will ever work right if you can't see correctly. That is why in the physical, we, uh, we treat uh, vision impairment as a disability. Is that right? right? If you are blind or vision impaired, it's considered a disability. That's true in the spiritual. If your vision is impaired, you are disabled. 
And most importantly, in the context of our lesson, is that you will never be able to find healthy resolution uh, to your conflict. So, human nature is this. We hate to be wrong, and we hate to be embarrassed. Uh, and if you, uh, if you uh, maybe you like to be wrong or you like to be embarrassed, you've got other problems I can't help you with. So here's the problem. If we don't like to be wrong, if we don't want to be embarrassed, if someone comes and places the blame on us, you know what, you big jerk, you did this, and what are we going to do? We are instinctively going to defend ourselves. We're going to defend our ego. We're going to defend our, how dare you say that, right? right? Let's be real. If someone comes up and says, you know, I've come to the conclusion that you're a jerk. You're a horrible person. You're a monster. You don't know how to raise your kids, right? And your house smells funny, right? How often would we say, oh, you know what? Thank you. Yeah, you, are, you are helping me to become a better person. I just so appreciate you. Right? That's not real life. That, we don't instinctively respond like that. Maybe uh, you, you, know, you can get to a level where you can respond uh, with peace, but uh, we're not usually pleased with that. And so here's the reality. Let, let's talk about your conflict for a moment. Most conflict is never about the issue, is it? It was, you know, it was about the issue in 1974. I get that. But by about 10 minutes later, it's no longer about the issue. You're not fighting about that. You're fighting about how you were fighting about the issue. Yeah, but see, you came up, you know, like you're all something, right? And then, no, 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 that's not even the issue. And so you'll spend the rest of your lives fighting about something else entirely. You've never resolved the issue. It's us defending our ego, defending our worth and our feelings and all of those things. And so uh, let me just suggest to you, if you've got long-term conflict, you've got conflict you find impossible to resolve, uh, sometimes it's how we're approaching the conflict. It's, it's this issue right here that we are, uh, we are neglecting to deal uh, with the real issues. Matthew 7, uh, verse 12. Therefore, whatever you want men do to, you, do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, remember, this is still the same context. We're still in, in the same conversation when he's talking about judging and the plank and the speck. And now he's making this absurd statement. Absolute. Right here, Jesus went nuts. He's talking about when there's relationship conflict, and then he says, you know what you need to do? You need to treat them well. Right? And I know you all disagree with me saying Jesus went nuts, but we feel that way, don't we? Treat them well? Did you see how they treated me? Do you see that big old plank sticking out of their face? They are messed up from the floor. I'm not treating them well. But Jesus, this is part of his great wisdom. If you want to resolve conflict, you're going to start with how you treat people. But they're disrespecting me. Who cares? But they said, but they did. Jesus says, you do what's right, right? So this is more than just being nice. This isn't just, you know, smile. Hi, how are you? <laughs> he, he actually says, what you want men to do to you. So what do you actually want them to do to you? You want them to treat you with honesty, with integrity, with respect, with kindness, in righteousness, right? This is wisdom in relationships and in conflict. And so, very practical uh, truth about human life is people instinctively react to you the way you react to them, right? We are, uh, you can get deep into the psychology of this, but we have a, a mirroring reflex that's instinctive in mankind, right? If you're out on the street, especially in our neighborhood, and someone runs up to you, right, with their hand up, hey, right? What are you going to do? Hey. No, not at all, right? That's instinctive in us. But when someone is smiling, hey, man, bro, how are you, right? It's instinctive. So why are you shocked when you go to someone, I want to tell you, and all of a sudden, they're accusing you of stuff. Why are you shocked by that? That's instinct. That's how humans work. So Jesus says, 
You need to uh, adjust your approach to people if you want to be able to find resolution to your conflict. So, here's the problem. Faulty vision affects our ability to resolve conflict, but more importantly than that, faulty vision ultimately will affect our relationship with God. Our vision in conflict revolves around two major things, how we view the other person and how we view us, right? And if we're going to be honest, in conflict, we view the other person as worse than they really are, and we view us as better than we really are. Can we agree on that this morning? Even if it's only a little bit. You know what God really hates? is dishonesty. Let's go ahead and read Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are, are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deceives, uh, devices wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to uh, evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. What's interesting about all these things that God hates or that are an abomination is how many of them can be tied to simple dishonesty. This is the essence of it. And so, let's be real. In conflict, if we are being dishonest about ourselves, and we believe, no, no, I'm, I'm innocent, I'm the victim here, right? How is that different than the list we just read? If we are maximizing their fault, but you don't understand, they're just wicked and they're out to get me. You know, we can't accept that they maybe just had a bad day and said something foolish. If we are being dishonest, listen, God hates that. God hates dishonesty. 1 John 1 verse 8. <clears throat> We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in this. I, I remember one time uh, dealing with an individual, and, uh, you know, it, it was a similar kind of thing. So, like, conflict, drama, you know, but listen, but you, uh, you know, the Bible says that, that we are all sinners. Is it possible uh, that, that you might have sinned in this? And she said, you are right, Pastor. I have sinned. You know how I sinned? You know, and that's one of these, you know. I sinned and that I trusted him too much. Oh, get over yourself. You lie. Right? It's like when you go to apply for a job. You know, what's your, you know, what's your biggest weakness? Oh, my biggest weakness is that I'm a perfectionist. Oh, you're not. Your biggest, biggest weakness is that you're dishonest, right? But, but let's be real. In conflict, that's where we most often say that we have no sin. We don't say that about all of our, we, we can look it up and say, oh yeah, no, I got sin. But not in this conflict issue, I am the innocent victim. So, there is a direct connection uh, between our relationships with people and our relationship with God. God actually even connects it to our prayer. Mark 11, verses 25 and 26. What a, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And so, this is a very practical thing. He's saying, essentially, if you want to talk to me, you got to work these things out. You can't live in unforgiveness and have a proper relationship with God. Right? There's a lot of reasons for that. Of course, the very simple is that he declared that it is so. But let's be real. The person you're in conflict with most likely is also a child of God. So how does God feel about that? Right, that you would be willing to speak evil of one of his children. Yeah, oh God, I love you so much. I think that that's a, a serious breakdown. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being the heirs together this is such a great scripture and then right at the end he's all that your prayers may not be hindered right the, the husbands are like yeah sure i'll be nice to my wife i can do that and then he drops that on him right because if you don't figure out this earthly relationship it could hinder your prayer 
I don't know what the mechanism is there. I don't know how that works. But this is a clear uh, statement from God that there is a potential that when there's a breakdown in human relationship, it creates a hindrance in our heavenly relationship. And then our text that we're reading from Matthew 7, it goes from relationships to prayer. By the end of this uh, singular discussion is when he's talking about ask, seek, and knock. And so this is all the same discussion when Jesus is giving wisdom about finding uh, a healthy resolution in relationships. He's connecting it to prayer. So this is the danger, is that you uh, make a mistake when you believe that you can live in conflict with God's people and live in peace with God. I believe that that is a, a deep error. So let's stop there for a moment. We've talked about uh, the results of faulty vision, see if we've stirred up any questions or any comments this morning. You can raise your hand with a question or a comment, something we can clarify. Okay, all the way in the back. Albert. Hang tight one second. The mic is not working. What's going on? So, Pastor, you talk about uh, faulty vision affecting our ability to resolve conflict. Uh -huh. So how do we get the correct ability so that we can be able to resolve conflict? You stick around for my third point. <laughs> oh, that's what we're going to talk about. Good question. Uh, Sipo. So, Pastor, what, what, what would you say... Uh, causes us like as human beings to, to always maybe see the other person as uh, being always wrong, but maybe it's, it's not easy to, to see yourself as maybe the, the cause of the conflict. Right. How do you say uh, bless out the vision? Yeah, that's, I think that's part of the human condition. We instinctively think we're pretty great, right? That's, that's just the, the nature of humanity. Um, and you know, for some reason, our flaws are hard for us to see, right? That's true in, in every circumstance. Uh, uh, you know, that's probably part of the curse of sin, I would say, is that it's hard for us to see ourselves honestly. But the dilemma is, is that everyone else's faults are so obvious to us. They're, they're just right in front of us. It's like smelling your own bad breath. We can't. It's, it's like, I don't know, it's like a... I think it's God's mercy to us, probably, right? But man, you can smell everyone else's, can't you? So I don't know, uh, it, that, but that seems to be a, uh, a flaw in us. Good question. With a bad answer, sorry. <laughs> Good, Jonathan. <clears throat> Pastor, when do, you, when do you see a situation where you are always triggered in conflict, where you do not respond well to a particular person and the, the thing it comes from you become defensive because you're always feeling attacked by this person so uh -huh. even before they say anything you already have your defenses up how do you see the, how do you get to a stage where you know you, you answer correctly and not allow yourself to be triggered well i can tell you from some personal experience I, i've had that situation and uh, I had to wrestle inside myself, what do I believe about this person? And so uh, one of the things Pastor Greg told me early on in one of my early pastoral crises uh, was that hurting people hurt people. And he says, if you could change your view from this person is trying to hurt me, change your view to this person is hurting, uh, it'll help you. Now, of course, that, you know, that sounds like a tweet, right? That's cute. But to, to actually do it, it, it involves uh, a constant discipline. I, when I would go to talk to this person, I would say, okay, God, listen, I know this is going to be offensive, right? But I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to see them differently. And when their, you know, their vomit would come out, I would, I would filter that. You know what? They're hurting. That's why they're saying this. They're messed up. So... Uh, in time, that does get easier, but it's an intentional decision. There's no switch that makes us not feel 
a certain way when people say hurtful things, but there's a decision we make. Okay, all right, maybe they're coming from somewhere else. Maybe they're coming from a broken home. They're messed up. Life is a, is a problem for them. They don't know how to respond to authority figures. I'm going to choose to see this differently. So it's going to have to be a discipline, an internal discipline. Good question. Good, what else? Uh, Jabu, and then we'll get Bongi after that. They're always offended by what? I didn't catch that part. When you tell them the truth. Like maybe some, uh, oh, when you tell them the truth. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, that's a whole different lesson. Uh, you know, truth uh, can be presented in many ways, right? And so uh, we have to be willing to accept it might be us. And so, uh, you know, uh, some people, they have a way of, of just being offensive. So let's make sure that that's not us. But, you know, the reality is sometimes we have to speak the truth and there's no, no nice way to put it or the, even the nicest way they get offended by. I don't know how to process that. You, you probably picked up in this series, my focus is always on us, not on other people who get offended. It's on us to adjust our responses. So, good. Bongi, your hand was up. Yes. And uh, I think uh, previously, like the other times, um, yeah, the previous lessons, you also said that um, just because we feel something, we, we end up like um, taking what we feel and we think that it's the truth. But okay, this is what I usually did. Like if I felt a certain way, even if I decided something different, I'd always, I'd always feel like, no, like if this is the truth, why do I feel this way? So like, how do you, <coughs> how do you like not, um, your emotions as truth because you feel that way and like you get those things right. to yeah, yeah. Just shut those usually time for most emotional circumstances time clarifies them uh, we've you've probably experienced that in, in the moment it's this enraging or it's sad or whatever but you give it a little bit of time and then you look back and you think oh, okay maybe it wasn't that so so time is usually the thing that changes it not always. Sometimes we can still feel things. Uh, but like I said in that lesson, emotion is inherently untrustworthy because it can be faked, right? We can fake it with movies. Uh, you know, someone could come and lie to you. Did you hear? You know what Pastor said about you? It was the most horrible thing. And you feel it for real, but it was totally false. So th that's why uh, I, I believe real maturity is the ability to decide correctly in spite of emotion. So, like I said, we, we can feel these things, but I'm going to choose to decide differently. So, I hope that helps. Good question. Good, what else? Yes, over here. Uh, Pastor, I just wanted to ask, uh, how do you solve a situation whereby a person treats you unfairly and when you tell him the truth and then he gets, like, uh, offended? Yeah, again, you know, like I said, we don't have, I don't have a tool set to fix how other people respond. I only have the tools to fix how we respond. So, unfortunately, that's a difficult one. Yeah, Daryl. He's coming. So, uh, that kind of brings up my question, because mm. right after I text, then Jesus says, do not, first he says, take the plank out of your eye, and then he says, do not cross the sword because it's fine. Right. So that kind of uh, say, well, but once you've done what you can do, then don't uh, keep on, you've got to, at some stage, you've got to just walk away from it right. and say, I've done what I can do, and then I'm not going to keep on going back and, and reliving this thing. I'm yes. going to just leave it. Now it's up to you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and, that, and that's wisdom in all of this. That's why Jesus, when he talked about prayer, he says, uh, go uh, make it right with your brother. But he doesn't actually say you have to fix your brother's response. We must do what we've got to do. Everyone else's response is up to them. Yeah, very good. Good. Any other questions or comments before we move on? 
All right, so let's talk about responsibility and healing because we're talking about responsibility in conflict. So we're going to talk about responsibility and healing. So, of course, our scripture is not forbidding uh, ever talking to people about a problem. That's one of the, the basic tenets we talked about a few weeks ago. You must, right? The pattern is if your brother sins against you, go speak to him. And so you must speak to people. Uh, it's dangerous because there is a weird religious twist we pick up sometimes. Uh, Matthew 7, verse 1. Judge not that you may not be judged. Here's the danger is that uh, we can take this out of context. This sounds spiritual, right? Judge not lest you also be judged, right? Now that's what happens when you're witnessing to people, right? The guy's standing there, you know, with his uh, weekend mama, right, smoking a joint. Judge not, brother, right, lest you also be judged. Well, that sounds spiritual, but that means absolutely nothing. In the context of conflict, uh, we're dealing with these kinds of issues. Uh, the, the problem is if we never judge anything, if we never deal with anything, nothing ever gets solved. Nothing gets healed. Many things get worse, and the work of God can be damaged. Our scripture is not saying don't, don't ever say anything, right? We, remember we read, you know, uh, you hypocrite. You've got a plank in your eye. How can you deal with uh, the speck in your brother's eye? Uh, but what does he actually say? Matthew 7, verse 5. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Wait a minute now. Now, now we're talking about real life, aren't we? Because here's the problem, right? When we're in conflict, we see that other dude, he's got a big old plank in his eye. How dare you talk to me? You don't know nothing. You're so messed up. But you know what? What if he deals with his issue and gets the plank out? What does the Bible say? Well, now he's got something to say. Now he can come help us with the speck in our own eye. So the real issue is it's not don't ever say anything because everybody's guilty all the time. The real issue is deal with yourself first, and then you can actually help people. You can be a blessing to other people. So, of course, this is going to involve humility. 1 Peter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you, uh, younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Uh, yes, uh, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I won't go into a great lengthy discourse here, but First Peter, he's talking about relationships in the church. Healthy relationships demand humility, and that means that sometimes other people are going to point out things that are wrong with you, and as a mature person, you should accept that. I've taken correction from people that I don't respect. You know why? Because they were right. Can we be real about that? I mean, the, the problem is we have this weird, you know, well, if pastor tells me, I'll listen. But, you know, listen, if they're right, listen anyway. You know what? I mean, you know, if they're telling you the truth, it's okay. <laughs> no, everyone's like, no, Pastor Heinberg, move on. <laughs> right? Uh, you know, every preacher's nightmare uh, is that we'd be on the stage, God is wonderful, and then you realize, <gasps> right? So this is how a lot of people live their life. Someone would be like, uh, hey, bro, uh, you know, you want to listen, listen, if my pastor tells me, right? And so you walk around your whole life with your zippers down. Right, because there's no one high enough that has ever corrected you. These, yeah, really, my, my zipper's down. Well, look at you. Your tie doesn't even match, bro. And that's how a lot of people live in relationships. I've had sinners correct me before. And they were right. So you know what? Wisdom listens sometimes. And so in conflict, this is the key issue. We've got to be humble enough to accept sometimes people are right, even when they are infuriating. I will deal with at a later point, but the issue of accusation. You know, accusation comes in three varieties. Two of them are rare and one is common. The rare ones is the accusation that's totally correct. That's very rare. 
The other rare one is the accusation that's totally false. Very rare. But you know what you see all the time? Is the accusation that's a little bit of both. Right? People will have something to say about you, and some of it is garbage, but some of it is true. Listen, if you want to succeed in life, you've got to learn how to take accusation and figure out the true part and say, okay, I'm apply that. That's, I'm, I'm putting this inside of me. The other stuff, you know, uh, you know, I'm not the worst person on the planet, but that one thing they said is true, and I will accept that. This requires humility. This also involves honesty. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. So in the context of conflict, we need to have this kind of honesty. We need to talk to God. What is my part in the conflict? Examine things. Did I cause this? Is there something that I did? Did I uh, possibly make it worse? You know, go back and replay. Not what they said. Replay what you said. Was I being a jerk? Was I, was I coming across too aggressive? Did I create conditions that were making it hard to resolve these things? This is honesty. So if we want to get healing, we're going to have to be uh, honest about these things. And so this gives us, in our scripture, this tremendous key to resolving conflict. And that is take responsibility. Take responsibility. If you're going to resolve conflict in a healthy manner, you're going to have to take responsibility. When you go and talk to people uh, about the issue, take responsibility. Uh, Proverbs 28, 13. <clears throat> he who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Who confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. That's true not just of God, but also of people. You know, some very practical things. Uh, you could say, I'm sorry. And I want to tell you something about the phrase, I'm sorry. It has no buts in it. You know, I'm sorry, but you really made me mad. That's not sorry. Sorry, you deleted it. In fact, the phrase, I'm sorry, should say, I'm sorry, and then there should be a period, and then that's it. If anything else comes after that, it's no longer an apology. You have completely invalidated it. I am sorry. I was wrong. I caused this. I made you angry or I caused you to be worried about these things or I offended you or I responded wrong and for that I am sorry. It's very dangerous when we try to make our apology an assault. I'm, I know that that doesn't happen in El Dorado Park. I've been your pastor long enough to know that this is not true but some of the evil people I used to pastor way long time ago, right? I'm sorry you're a jerk. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. That's not an apology. We had this major crisis in a church I used to pastor, and it was, and I, and I mean a major. This was going to be an existential issue uh, for some families in the church. There was a guy that was creating a massive problem and uh, spoke to him. You're going to go. You're going to speak to this man. Was, there was a guy on staff. Uh, you're going to apologize for what you did. And if you can't get this right, I'm putting your family out of the church. So th this, this is a life or death kind of issue. And so his first attempt at an apology <laughs> was like this. Uh, for, you know, his big thing. You know, he was making a big production out of it. But what he actually said was, you know, I'm sorry that you interpreted it that way. <laughs> so I said, listen, I called him back in. Okay, listen, I'm going to be Mr. Gracious today. But I don't think you understand what an apology even is. You don't even get the concept of it. I'm sorry that you interpreted it that. That is not an apology. You're actually saying you're dumb. You didn't understand what I'm saying. I'm sorry that you made me do that. I'm just so angry right now. I just, no, 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 no. That's not an apology. So the problem with that is that it looks like you're trying to fix it and you're making it worse. You know, as long as I've been a pastor... Uh, you know, it, it's interesting sometimes there are parallels between pastoring and parenting I will tell people alright I want you to go apologize you go say sorry I'm going to watch you right okay and then, you know, they're looking, 
And all I see is, you know, what they're actually saying is, you know, I'm sorry, and they're making it worse. Okay, listen, that, that's not helping. Listen, taking responsibility, this is not just being Christian, although it is that. This is just wisdom. If you want to find resolution in conflict, taking responsibility gives you the greatest chance of ever finding healing uh, in the issue. If you will take legitimate responsibility, uh, these people are much more likely to hear you, to listen to you. They'll receive uh, what you're saying. Matthew 7, verse 12. Therefore, whatever you want men do to you, do also to them for this is the law and the prophets. In other words, how you want them to respond, you need to approach it that way. One of the things that I have discovered in life, and this is not universal, this is not a magic trick, but it works a lot of the time, is if you go and apologize legitimately and take responsibility, they'll do the same thing. I've gone to people that had offended me and did all the, and, and just say, you know what, I am so sorry. You know, I, whatever I did, I, I messed up, I made you mad, I'm sorry. And you know what I've had happen a lot of times is they'll say, no, you know what, I'm sorry. I was being a jerk. But see, it never works if you go up and say, hey, you were being a jerk. They never say, you're right, I'm a jerk. But by this magic of mirroring that's in the human personality, if we take responsibility, you go up to them and legitimately take this on yourself, you'll discover sometimes they will do the same. If we say, I was wrong, often they will do the same as well. That's human nature. If you don't attack their ego or their worth, then they're able to back down and see wisdom. And then, of course, God can get involved when he sees our honesty and our humility. All right, let's stop right there. We've got a few minutes. We can open for questions or comments this morning. Yes, Moesha. Yes. They will always be right. Whatever they do something wrong, they will always be right. So how do you deal with a person that say they do something wrong or they say something, you know, and this is mm. a person in authority. And you go to them and you say that I think that was wrong or you just try and correct them, but they always put on a defensive mode. Right. I'm never wrong. Right. You know, they will never step back and say, hey, maybe she's right. Maybe... Maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I did say that wrongly. Maybe it came yeah. out wrong. Let me go and apologize. They never do that. Mm. They always put on a defensive mode, like, I'm never wrong. You are the one that's wrong. You know, how do you deal with people like that? Because sometimes you just throw, you come to a point where you just throw in the towel and you say, you know what? It's fine. I'm not going right. to deal with this person. I'm just going to leave it. Sure. Well, you know, a, a couple of things. One, you know, as we discussed, uh, you know, a few moments ago, there are some some relationships that we can't heal the conflict in, right? Uh, and that's just life. We we do have to figure out a, a, a way to live life without uh, letting that consume us. But, you know, a, a practical thing, you know, as I was just mentioning, uh, usually confronting the wrong head on is the least effective way to bring resolution, right? When we say, "Listen, you said this, and that was wrong." That it's just unfortunately that's not the, the most effective way of dealing with it. In relationship conflict, it's usually taking responsibility, right? You know, I think what you're describing is more like, you know, uh, someone, a boss or an authority figure just doing wrong. Unfortunately, like I said, I don't have the tools to fix them. I only have the tools to fix how we respond to it. So it's a difficult one. Good. What else? Yes. Here in the front. The sister said, uh -huh. how do you deal with someone who's always so wrong? Me, when I deal with someone who's always wrong, uh, I normally pray to God and refer to the Bible to say, God, you know why this person uh, 
you think me that this cause the Bible is also saying we have to endure in hardship in order for us to be strong? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, that's your your best bet. You keep talking to God, you strengthen your relationship with God, and you trust that one day God will help them. So, yeah, very good. Good. What else? We got a couple more minutes. Anything else? Yes, Daryl. So, uh, for me, so, so basically, if somebody offends you or you've got a conflict with somebody, uh-huh. I mean, it comes down to pride at the end of the day. Like, like my pride against your pride. That's why you say, if you go and say, I was sorry, I'm sorry, I was wrong, mm. I mean, normally it's like that, it, it breaks it. But what happens when somebody does something to you, not to you directly, but maybe to your family, mm. then it becomes a little bit more like uh, that protective. Right. Like part of you keeps you in it. Right. Are you, would you still put that under pride? Or? I don't know, I guess. You know, there could be many uh, uh, varieties of that, I guess. But, you know, if someone sins against us, you know, the Matthew 18 pattern, go speak to him. Uh, I think it still applies. We can speak to them and try to find resolution. Of course, you know, uh, when resolution comes, that's wonderful. But if it doesn't, you know, we have to move on in life. Uh, but with the issue of, uh, of that, yeah, I would say sometimes uh, it could certainly be our pride. But maybe not all the time. Yeah, good question. Good. Yes. Pumlani? So would you say um, if you pick up, so this might not be an issue at the moment, but you can pick up like something you preached on one time about mocking. Mm. Like we know that when people continue mocking, mocking, it right. ends up becoming an issue. Right? Mm-hmm. So would you say that in any stages of uh, something that is potentially going to be start a conflict, would you say it's good to just resolve it at the time or we yes. should wait for it to kick in and be like, oh. <laughs> wait till it's painful? No. <laughs> resolve it as soon as possible. That's, that's my advice. All right, very good. We're going to break. Service begins at 1030. <laughs>